Okay, well, this is History 362, Lecture 6, as we continue to consider the experiences of African Americans during the really low point of the Jim Crow period. Um, lynching is a topic that is a very serious and sad topic, but one that we need to discuss. And I'm going to also be talking about the birth of blues music as one of the possible reactions or forms of resistance by African Americans in the time period that we are studying. Lynching. Uh, what is lynching? Well, there are various different definitions that people have come up with, but uh, one of the most recent and I think most tangible definitions of lynching uh, comes out of the book American Lynching that was published in around 2010, by which lynching is, quote, an act of extra legal violence by a group alleging pursuit of summary justice. So this definition of lynching expands lynching to really any episode of racial violence inflicted by a group who are saying, well, we're doing this because we want justice or justice is not available to us. It expands it beyond just the unlawful hanging of individuals to other forms of racial violence too and makes it a more inclusive term. The term lynching dates from the period of the American Revolutionary War. Charles Lynch, who was the leader of the Bedford County, Virginia militia, captured insurgent Tories, that is insurgent pro-British fighters, and hanged some of them without a trial or military tribunal of any kind. And the governor of Virginia at the time, Thomas Jefferson, wrote a letter saying to him, oh, you know, good for you that you did this, but in the future, please deliver prisoners to the state so we can try them rather than you being a vigilante. Lynch did not listen to this advice or mandate. He just kept on doing his uh, vigilante vi violence. And um, this came to be called Lynch's Law. And so Lynch's Law became, became kind of slang for um, the extrajudicial judicial system, you know, taking the law into your own hands. So this was by the 1780s and 1790s. Before the Civil War, there was lynching against members of many different groups, including Mexicans, Native Americans, those in Western counties where there was not a judicial system set up yet, or Western territories uh, who had stolen horses or in other ways offended against the um, social norms of the place. There were even vigilance committees set up in places that didn't have a regular judicial system like San Francisco in the 1850s. San Francisco's so-called vigilance committee hanged eight men charged with crimes. So again, we have a slippage where people are being executed without the benefit of a trial. Here are some um, photos of lynchings that took place later in the 19th century. Photography of lynching, as I will talk about in a moment, is very, very common. It seemed like the crowds that lynched people really wanted a record made of their activities. Few African Americans were lynched before the Civil War because African Americans were held as property and it would have been the destruction of valuable property of white people had enslaved people been lynched. There were, though, several categories of offense where lynching was pretty much mandatory. If a master were murdered, that was considered to be a kind of treason against the state. Um, if somebody was fomenting an insurrection against white people or if someone had raped a white woman, or of course, even if there were allegations made that these things had happened, there would be there could be lynching of an enslaved person. Because one of the only things protecting African Americans from lynching during and before the Civil War was their status as property, as soon as African Americans were freed, the restraints by white people were off, 
and terrorist groups proliferated during the Reconstruction era. The Ku Klux Klan, the so-called Knights of the White Camellia, the Pale Faces, um, these were all names of groups that used mob violence and individual hangings of black people during the period of Reconstruction. But lynching as a ritual meets its most refined form, I guess, between 1880 and 1930, when it was a pretty significant activity in the states of the South. It was very common. Um, once or twice a week, even in some years, uh, was the number of lynchings that occurred in the South, as we're going to see. And it was an important sort of bonding ritual for uh, racist white people in the South. Lynching really came into its own during this period as a ritual for the white community, more than being about the punishment of some particular offense or person who had been accused of committing an offense. The official story was always that um, some crime had been done or there was some necessity of protecting white womanhood. Although the most common allegation was that someone had been raped, really um, a number of any number of violations of white supremacy might really be the cause of someone being lynched insisting on having their wages paid, disagreeing with a white man in public, making eye contact with a white woman, or really no offense at all. Because the point of lynching was to um, scare people into submission, white people claimed that the actual reason that they lynched people was that the law took too long to operate and that certain offenses, especially rape of a white woman, uh, was such an outrage that they were kind of pushed past their moral boundaries and they needed to do something immediately. As the historian uh, Jacqueline Dowd Hall has pointed out, this notion that lynching was to protect white womanhood had several different impacts in addition to causing the death of black men. The need to quote unquote protect white womanhood also meant that white women were supposed to be submissive and fearful, and in turn, it meant that black women were targets of white men's um, sexual violence, but there wasn't any, there wasn't any judicial follow-up when that happened. On the right here is the writing side of some of the postcards that were made about lynching. So the other side of these postcards would show pictures of a lynching, and then this side shows what people wrote. So here we have, this is where they lynched a Negro the other day. They don't know who done it. I guess they don't care much. I don't, do you? And then the bottom one, um, which on the other side showed a man having been hanged and then set on fire. It says, this is the barbecue we had last night. My picture is to the left with a cross over it, your son, Joe. So somebody very proud that he had participated in a lynching. The ritual of lynching went like this. A white crowd would find the black person that they wanted to lynch. Either they would grab them out of the community or they would break them out of prison. They would accuse that person of some grievous crime. The crowd would be gathered together because these were events that were almost carnivalesque in their attraction to white southern people and it wasn't just men who came out to watch lynching people brought their wives people brought their children uh, gallows would be constructed um, even if it just meant throwing a rope over a tree the person the victim would be tortured and strung up on the gallows and hanged. Sometimes the body would be set on fire. There was desecration of the body either before or after death, Cut people cutting off pieces, uh, very often cutting off the uh, genitalia to kind of make some kind of sexually violent point, and people would take souvenirs home. And then the occasion would be commemorated. 
People really wanted to take pictures. This was all part of asserting white supremacy. Look what we're doing may be illegal, but it's not immoral. You know, we're proud of the fact that we lynched somebody. So here's another example on top. And uh, below you see a news report that talks about it. So lynchings, not difficult at all to document. Here are some postcards of lynchings. This is the, uh, on the top left, the barbecue photo that I was talking about on the previous postcard. I don't see Joe with a cross over his head, but uh, just a really disturbing set of photos here. Um, the bottom left is the back of the photograph. This SOB was hung at Clanton, Alabama, Friday, August 21st, 1891, for murdering a little boy in cold blood. Or at least that's the allegation. We have lots of kids looking up at that one. And then on the right, um, look at the expression on that little white girl's face. That is the most disturbing thing, that somebody could participate in this violence and find it to be so so amusing. Well, lynching was noticed by the black community and a lot of the uh, more socially justice focused uh, members of the white community. And so lynching was reported on as a social problem. The Chicago Tribune began to publish an annual report of lynchings in 1882. Monroe Work, who was a sociologist at the Tuskegee Institute, also collected information uh, about where and when lynchings had taken place. And Tuskegee Institute's um, research department, as you can see, made this map. And you will see where the lynchings are um, all concentrated in certain states of the South. Uh, these numbers, though, did not include things like the 1906 Atlanta race riots because the definition of lynching was not such as to include that kind of mob violence in the context of a riot. Nonetheless, between 1882 and 1927, a total of 3,516 lynchings were documented, of whom, interestingly enough, only 76 were women. So... Again, this was meant to <coughs> create gender as well as racial boundaries um, and create sort of deference and deterrence among African-American men in particular. One of the major lobbyists against the lynching uh, movement was Ida B. Wells Barnett. Ida Wells, as she was born, was born into slavery in Mississippi, but slavery was eliminated by the time she was three years old, so she didn't really have a memory of slavery. She was sent to school by her father, who was a trained carpenter. She then began to work as a teacher in the segregated schools of Memphis, Tennessee. In September 1883, while commuting by train, she was asked to leave the so-called ladies' car, which was a car for women that didn't have people smoking, didn't have people swearing, but it was limited to white women. And she was asked to um, go to the smoking car where all the African-Americans were expected to sit. She refused to leave. And in fact, when the conductor of the train attempted to bodily remove her, she bit the conductor. Um, and she also filed a suit against the railroad, uh, which she won. She won in the local court. At the next level, the state Supreme Court reversed the successful decision, but her account of the way that she had been treated in a local black newspaper launched her journalism career. And so she began to write articles for the local black newspaper. She acquired her own newspaper and she really switched to full-time journalism. Now, one of the things that made her the most militant was a 
triple lynching in Memphis in 1892. There were three very respectable young black men who opened a grocery store called the People's Grocery. A white competitor resented that this grocery store had been opened. There was a chain of events triggered and three young black men were lynched for absolutely no reason. She had known that lynchings happened to innocent people, but the fact that these guys were so respectable, like suddenly brought to her the front of her mind that this was not just a class issue, it was a racial issue. She turned the full force of her pen against lynching, attacking the premise that lynching was a necessary deterrent to black rapists. She said, you know, lynching is almost never about rape. Many rape charges, she alleged, stem from actual consensual relationships between white women and black men. These relationships are consensual, but when they're discovered, the white woman says, oh, he raped me, and um, then a lynching occurs. Now, she was absolutely right about that, but angry mobs besieged her office, closed her newspaper, ran her out of Memphis, and she ended up going to New York, where she put together a real indictment of lynching called Southern Horror's Lynch Law in all its phases. She argued that what lynching really was about was to counteract black achievement and that as African Americans rose up in the social scale, as they became more successful economically, lynching was used to keep them down, to keep them in their place. She began to tour to promote her ideas and uh, Wells Barnett, as she was known after her marriage, participated in the formation of the NAACP, as well as several women's clubs for African American women. It's interesting to note that uh, Wells and some other African-American leaders at this point um, advocated the carrying of weapons by African-Americans for self-protection as a means of counteracting uh, lynching. Um, that she said, you know, what really is going to protect black homes, I'm paraphrasing now, is a Winchester uh, rifle. But Wells Barnett, very important as a loud voice and a female voice against lynching. The campaign against lynching continued after Wells Barnett had written um, not just her first pamphlet, but other pamphlets. Beginning in the 1890s, some states, including six southern states, passed legislation against lynching. But what really needed to happen for it to be uh, eliminated would have been a federal anti-lynching law. Because if you were arrested for lynching somebody in the South, in the unlikely event that you were arrested, an all-white jury in a white courtroom with a white judge was not going to find you guilty. Federal anti-lynching laws were introduced 61 times between the 1890s and 1933, and then 131 more times between 1933 and 1940. Um, you'll notice that 1933 to 1940 is during the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration. And although Eleanor Roosevelt was really, really in favor of a federal anti-lynching law, she was unable to get her husband to go along with it. He was very committed to getting the New Deal legislation passed. So the country was in the Great Depression. And at this point, the South, the solid South, was solidly Democratic voting in Congress and in the Senate. And the um, Southern Democrats were also extremely racist. And so Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, didn't feel like he could alienate his Southern supporters by supporting anti-lynching legislation. So clearly, along with Japanese internment, not Franklin Roosevelt's greatest hour whatsoever. Lynching petered out after the mid-1930s, but there were still sometimes uh, murders or mob violence that are either classified as or should be classified as lynchings. One good example is the murder of young Chicago boy named Emmett Till. He was 14 years old. He went to the South to visit some relatives. 
a white woman who was in her late teens accused him of having whistled at her. And then he was taken off by some white men and beaten to a bloody pulp and killed. And then his mother, Mamie Till, made sure that he had an open casket funeral. So you can see the sort of post-beating and pre-beating pictures of Emmett Till. She wanted to show everyone what the impact of racial violence was. And so this was a very powerful moment. Now, it will surprise none of you to hear that the white woman who said that Till had wolf whistled at her was lying. I mean, not like it would have been uh, illegal for a young uh, black person to flirt with a white person in the South where he was visiting his cousins anyway. But the whole thing was predicated on a lie. The woman who is now in, I want to say her 80s, said, oh, I made the whole thing up. Well, what were the responses to this terrible low point in American history in which Jim Crow was uh, ascendant and racial violence was tolerated? The UC Berkeley historian, University of California at Berkeley historian Leon Litwak says that there were a few possible responses to Jim Crow by the African-American community. He said a lot of people just put their heads down, tried very hard not to be noticed by white people, went along with the social strictures of Jim Crow, didn't talk to white women, didn't look at people in the eye, went about their business and said, what's most important is survival. The survival of myself and my children, and we will just persist and hopefully not be killed. Part of this was turning their energy into religious observance. So there was a lot of a really powerful sort of end times theology, millennialism. A lot of people joined holiness churches, which were evangelical churches, and the black community really put its hope in not exactly the afterlife, but in uh, religious doctrine and religious hope. A second possible outcome or a second possible reaction to the, you know, terrible uh, oppression of the Jim Crow period was accommodationism. We talked about Booker T. Washington already attempting to make small changes while working with the white community. A third idea was resistance. So you had legal resistance like the NAACP, boycotts like the streetcar boycotts that I've mentioned before, the notion of armed self-defense, and then participation in an autonomous culture that really did not include white people, that allowed people to not exactly practice escapism, but to enjoy themselves in a way that um, kind of marginalized the oppression of the white community. And he thought that the blues, the music of the blues, was one of the ways in which this autonomous culture made itself known. The blues, the music the blues had its roots in the songs of the slave period, which in turn had their roots in the call and response songs that were sung in Africa. Um, those kinds of songs moved to the field during slavery time, so they were sung in order to move the work along. One major difference though is that when music became the blues, it was normally by a single musician singing about his or her own experiences as opposed to being a whole community of people in a field singing a song together. The call and response now was between the man or woman and his guitar. So somebody would um, sing a phrase and then their guitar would sing a phrase or their harmonica would sing a phrase. And the individual here stands for the collective. Somebody's singing about something that happened to them, but their experience is emblematic of the experiences of other people in the, in the black community. Um, blues had its origins in the Mississippi Delta in the area called the Black Belt, not called the Black Belt because of the population of African-Americans, called the Black Belt because of the richness of the soil and the fact that a lot of cotton grew there. So it's the late 19th, early 20th century in this 
uh, sharecropping cotton area of the Mississippi Delta, very impoverished area where the blues comes to be. Here's one of the most long lived uh, musicians, David Honeyboy Edwards, who was born in 1915 and died in 2011. He was called the last of the original bluesmen. <clears throat> the blues, Southern blues, kind of talked back to Jim Crow or um, was a response to Jim Crow in several ways. One kind of blues music could celebrate Southern quote unquote bad men who had taken the law into their own hands. One example was Robert Charles, who responded to a terrible 1900 uh, miscarriage of justice, the lynching of a guy named Sam Hose, by Charles decided to take up guns and go on a vengeance spree. He holed up in the room of his boarding house in New Orleans, and he shot 27 white men, including four policemen, before a mob of 10,000 white people gathered around and drove him out of his hiding place by setting his boarding house on fire. So somebody like Robert Charles, almost a, a superhero in blues music, would be celebrated, or somebody like Stagger Lee or Stack Lee, or uh, somebody like John Henry, the perhaps mythical, perhaps not, um, steel driving man who managed to compete against um, industrial machinery. So <clears throat> part, of the, part of the topic of the blues involves this. There are also topics like work, um, imprisonment, sexuality, uh, the use of drugs and alcohol, psychological responses to oppression. So the blues captured and dealt with all the different kinds of um, ways in which people might be dealing with the uh, oppression of Jim Crow. And it was played in juke joints throughout the South. These are really small, um, small venues where it was really just African-Americans who came to dance and drink and enjoy themselves. So these, it's kind of a private culture that was insulated from um, being observed by the white community. Most white Southerners looked at black blues music and where it was played and said, oh, this is immorality. We disapprove of this. A lot of the um, blues uh, songs and lyrics, titles of blues songs were sexual. There was the coffee grinder blues, the black snake blues, the jelly roll blues, ramrod daddy, and please warm my wiener. So those were among popular blues titles. Uh, there was even one um, called Take a Whiff of Me, which was about sniffing cocaine. So blues musicians kind of played with white stereotypes of their depravity and kind of rubbed it back in their faces. They were trying to say, if this is what you think of me, this is what I think back of what you think of me. A good example of a blues musician from this time was Huddy Ledbetter, and you can see his picture there on the right. He was born in 1888 in Mooringsport, Louisiana. His parents were sharecroppers on a cotton farm, and his father was one of the definite, I want to keep my head down and just have my family survive guys. He saved and scrimped and managed to buy his own little farm. He hoped that Huddy and his many siblings would follow in his footsteps as a farmer, but as soon as Huddy was 14, he kept traveling to Shreveport, which was 19 miles away, to hang out with musicians and women. He played the guitar. He got in a lot of physical fights. Um, he came back bloody with his guitar beaten up on his back. For some reason, Huddy's father gave him a pistol for his 16th birthday. He, Huddy, pistol whipped a guy and shot him before trying to make time with his girlfriend. And... Uh, this was the beginning of a pretty violent personal career. Um, Huddy traveled all around throughout Texas and, and other places in the South. Um, he got married. He and his wife <coughs> worked with another blues musician, Blind Lemon Jefferson. But he did a few stints in prison for killing people in what he said was self-defense. He was 
imprisoned at the Sugarland Prison Farm outside of Houston, where he had a lot of time to practice the guitar and meet other musicians, as well as working on the prison farm. And the way he was released early from that prison was by doing a command performance of his music for the prison warden, who ended up pardoning him after seven years of his term. Now, within another few years, he had killed somebody else in a knife fight. Huddy ended up in Angola prison, a pretty notorious prison farm in Louisiana. And he, again, did a lot of playing and practicing along with being on the prison farm. While he was at Angola, his music was discovered by these two guys, uh, white guys, John Lomax, who was an ethnomusicologist, and his son, Alan, who was like a folk singer and a bit of a political radical, they were collecting music for the Smithsonian Institution. And they recorded Huddy and they recorded his music. They arranged for him to have early release again. And then they hired him as their driver. And he and they went all around the South collecting folk music. So it was his influence that was really responsible for introducing them to a lot of the blues musicians who are famous today, but were only locally famous or famous within the African American community before the Lomaxes came along. Um, Lead Belly, as his stage name was, was emblematic of many aspects of the Southern blues musician that I was talking about. He sang songs that protested the Jim Crow order. He got in trouble with the law. He sometimes had to accommodate, as when he sang a song about the prison warden, as well as resist. And his music appealed to people on many levels. In the black community, it appealed to people for its truth. And in the white community, people were like hipsters and said, oh, this music is so awesome, which, you know, musically speaking, it is quite awesome. But it was kind of not for them. And uh, this was an aspect of blues music that did and I think does make it a, uh, a form of resistance, a cultural resistance. All right, see you in the comments. Oh, um, here are some important blues figures. Forgot I put this page on here. So I talked about uh, Blind Lemon Jefferson. John Hurt is in one of your assignments this week. So is Furry Lewis down there, um, Sunhouse, the guy who really invented slide guitar, according to uh, Lead Belly. And on the right, the famous Robert Johnson, who uh, was, um, people rumored he had made a deal with the devil, and that's what made him such a good blues musician. So he had like this weird mythology surrounding him. Robert Johnson and many of these other blues musicians were quite impactful later on um, British bands, on rock bands of the late 1960s and early 1970s. So they were kind of rediscovered and appropriated, culturally appropriated by, by white musicians.